teaching is a lifetime learning process. And uh, if we become stale, if we don't, if we don't keep learning about fishing. Uh, some people will, will learn just different methods, and that's all they'll learn. But what we want to try to do is to learn all about fish, more about the lakes, more about the structure, more about the weather, water conditions. All these things that we learn about will help us improve our fishing, uh, not necessarily just the methods. Uh, there's many methods out there, and they all catch fish, uh, or they wouldn't be used. They all catch fish. But are we going to learn them all? And are we going to buy equipment for every one of the thousands of methods, ways to present lures? Uh, I recommend that you pick one and stick with it for a while and really learn it. Because whether you're back trolling night crawlers or whatever, the more you learn about that method and how it works in different lakes, the better you're going to be. Now, uh, what is your goal in fishing? What do you want from fishing? Uh, this is what you have to ask yourself and then pick how, what approach you're going to do to fishing. Uh, I'm going to define spoon plugging. It isn't for everybody, but I'm going to define it. And I told you what my goals were. Uh, fishing all waters, all species, and targeting big fish. And uh, you can see if this is something that you, uh, that you want to do. Uh, spoon plugging is not just using spoon plugs. We use other lures also, but we use the knowledge. It's a simple orderly and precise manner in which to fish for all species on all waters and we target the big fish. Now later in the talk here I'm going to mention to you about how we target big fish. And we do catch our share of big fish and why do we catch our share of big fish. I'm going to explain that in a, in a little bit. It's not just another method. It is a body of knowledge created by a man named Buck Perry. <coughs> And uh, he is the father of modern-day structure fishing. Uh, he's one of the most successful fishermen that ever lived. Uh, just passed away this past year and has given us information about fishing that will last us a lifetime to learn. Uh, this book of his, uh, Spoon Plugging, is an excellent, I call it the Bible of Structure Fishing. And uh, there's a, the uh, study series on the uh, uh, table over there. Uh, the home study series, uh, there's more information than we can gather in a lifetime in there, and so it keeps us going. Spoon plugging is, uh, emphasizes unselfish attitude, conservation of the resource, and family recreation. It is a total concept for su successful fishing. Now, spoon plugging encompasses eight areas of knowledge. Uh, this is the basic guideline. Spoon plugging the basic guideline. What this says, I'm not going to read it here, but what this says is, uh, it tells us about the fish behavior, how he reacts to his environment, and it tells us how we best can catch him. This is spoon plugging in a nutshell. If you want to know what spoon plugging is all about, uh, this right here. I'll pass this around, and uh, these are there are eight areas of knowledge that Mr. Perry talks about. Uh, I'll pass that around, and uh, you can kind of glance at that. And then there are there, I do have copies of that up on, on the literature I have up in the on the front there. Uh, this is another rendition of these eight areas of knowledge that Buck calls his success wheel, success and satisfaction. And satisfaction is something we have to think about too. But all these, the mental, the movement of fish, the features or the structure, weather and water, lake types, mapping and interpretation controls and tools, and, and presentation. A lot of people just concentrate on the presentation, but this other is very important too. And we'll become a better fisherman the more of these spokes of the wheel that we have to, uh, to our access. The more we learn about all these areas, these eight areas of knowledge. So what I'm going to do, I'll pass that around and look at that. What I'm going to do is talk to you about the eight areas of knowledge that he mentions. And uh, these eight areas, I'm just going to be able to touch, I, I certainly can't give you all the information in spook plugging in a short talk like this. But uh, you'll have an idea of uh, what he talks about, and then this can all be gotten from the book and the study series. Now, first of all, is the basic movements of fish. Uh, deer hunters, uh, deer and fish are, are somewhat similar because they react to their environment in, in a very similar way. Uh, deer hunters will go out and they're going to study the terrain, they're going to follow the edges. They're going to find the pathways where the deer go. This is all before they go hunting. 
They're going to actually, many of them will draw maps, uh, and the good hunters will draw maps of where they're going to be, and they're going to find out, okay, this is where I want to sit to have the best chance to get a deer. And that's what we do in fishing. Now, it's not as easy to see these pathways. We don't see droppings along the, along the pathways of fish because it's underneath the water. But through mapping and through our knowledge of the lake bottom and structure, uh, we can do the same thing. Now, the home of the fish is deep water. We're talking about 30 to 35 feet. Uh, this is a home where they spend most of their time and they're usually very inactive. They're tough to catch. But once or twice on a normal fishing day, they will become active and they may move towards the shallows. They may only move a little ways, sometimes they'll go all the way. And that depends on the weather and the water conditions, which allow them to do that. Uh, these movements of fish are normally fairly short, rather in minutes rather than hours. So it's, we don't have a lot of time when these fish move up, become active, uh, are easier to catch, and then they, be, they come in and go down deep. Structure. Structure is, is the second uh, area of knowledge. Uh, I have a handout here on structure. This talks a little bit about uh, more what structure is involved in. Of course, uh, I'll pass this around. You can look at it also. This is uh, one of the handouts up there, but pass this one around so people can glance at it. Um, Structure is defined very simply as the bottom of the lake that's different from the surrounding area. Simple. Closed. That's all there is to it. It's different areas of the bottom of the lake that's different from the surrounding areas. Now, structure is made up of breaks and break lines. Breaks being rocks, uh, pile of rocks, stumps, sunken boats, whatever. These are areas the fish are going to pause at. Break lines are like a weed line or like a drop-off. And these are pathways that those fish will move along. And so we have the pathways and we have the pause areas for the fish. And this is where we want to, con want to concentrate our fishing. Get a better chance to catch a fish. So the more we learn about the form of the breaks and break lines and the, and the structure, the better off we're going to be because that's where we're going to spend most of our time fishing, not out in the open area somewhere where the fish aren't, aren't necessarily following. Bar, hump, reef, all of these are structures, and they're composed of breaks and break lines. The structure is a guide to where the fish are. That's where they pause, and that is the key in fishing, is finding the structure. Now, one of the other, one of the next areas of knowledge uh, in fish and fishing is weather and water. Buck talks about this in his book. Now, first of all, weather. How does weather affect fish? Light is the key because fish's eyes will gather in five times as much light as our eyes do. Now, they don't have any eyelids. They can't close their eyes. They don't have any pupils where, they, where the light will automatically be, be cl closed down. They're a very low-light animal, just like a deer. Uh, in the daytime, most of the bright sun, most of the deer are down in the, in the deep, dark areas of the swamp. And the same way with fish. They're down in their home area, 30, 35 feet. Now, the reason it's 30 to 35 feet is because uh, it's been calculated that most of the light is gone in 30 to 35 feet. This is the home area of the fish. That's a stable area in the light condition for them. They can't adjust quickly. So they have to, they have to take time to adjust. Sometimes it's two or three days. Uh, the cold front is the basis for understanding light and how fish react to it. Nice stable weather for two or three or four or five days. Clouds coming in, building up. The light doesn't change much at all. Uh, the fish start moving more shallow, more shallow, get good movements. Uh, all of a sudden, the cold front comes through. Boom. Clouds are gone. The bright sun is up. Light penetrates down into the water. Those fish and their eyes, they, they cannot adjust to that. What do they do? All, the only thing they can do is go deep. If, 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 even if they go in the weeds, they're really turned off because... Uh, the weeds don't take out as much light as that deep water does. If they got the deep water, they'll go there. If they don't have it, then they'll be in the weeds, wherever they can get them. And that's why you can catch them under docks sometimes. They haven't had a chance to get back to the deep water, so they, they hide under the docks, but they're very inactive. Uh, the second part of this is watercolor. Now, there's five kinds of watercolor that Buck classifies. Uh, the white sandy, red sandy, yellow green, 
uh, the clear water and the cypress water. Now, white sandy, red sandy, down in Kentucky, reservoirs, we don't have it. Forget about it. It's the best water color at all. It's good. It's a lot of turbidity in the water. When we talk about yellow-green, we're talking about Lake Makatawa, Mono Lake, these lakes that have pretty good turbidity in them. It doesn't necessarily relate to pollution, but it can. But it, turbidity is just particles in the water that will block out light. And that makes allows the fish to come shallower. I'll pass this around. You can kind of look at the classifications of that, uh, of the different water colors. That is important. That's the, one of the biggest things we can select when we go fishing is good water color because it allows the fish to come shallower. Now, when, when I'm fishing for a fish, if he's on a weed line that's four feet deep, I can put my lure right in front of his nose, which I need to do to catch him. But when I got a weed line that goes to 20 feet and I want to put my fish right in front of his nose, that's a bigger problem, a lot bigger problem. So I'm going to go for the water color where I got much more better access to the fish. They're shallower, they're easier to catch. That's, that's the key. Uh, like in Lake, Lake Mac and uh, in Mona Lake, the weed line's only four feet. Well, I can fish that four foot, foot weed line real easy. But fishing the base of that 20 foot weed line in Muskegon Lake, that's another story. That's a challenge. It can be done, but you gotta take, you gotta work at it a lot and do a lot of practice. The next subject that uh, Mr. Perry talks about is mapping and interpretation. 90% of the water contains no fish. We're talking about the structure that, that the fish will relate to. Uh, and so we want to find it. We want to find that structure and we want to put our lure right there. A lot of times we use this, this marker. A point sticks out in the lake. Put the marker on the tip of the point, let this, this uh, go down, and we can see on the lake where the point of that marker is, uh, where the point of that bar, a structure that we're looking at. It's important that we see on the lake because the lake is where we put our lure. We see in our little box, our little uh, Depth sounder, we can't put our lure in a depth sounder. We've got to put it on the lake. So we got to picture in our mind what's down there, where the brake lines are, where the fingers are, where the rock piles are, and all that. We can look at it and relate it to both the marker, to the land, to the shoreline, to other things. Uh, it's, it's a different story because we've got to know where to, put that mark, uh, where to put that lure. And it won't go in the depth sounder, although they can be helpful. But uh, sometimes we overdo on the depth sounder. We have to say we're on the lake and we've got to put our lure where the fish are. Uh, mapping interpretation, this is a map of uh, Lake Mankatawa, and uh, these are areas I've marked on here, different, no, different letters of structure, basically areas that are different from the surrounding uh, area. So those are areas of structure. Uh, but we can go to one of these, like this F here, we we'll go to that and, yeah, there's a little bar there, okay, let's go over, you go over to F, and it's like 300 yards wide, and you're sitting on the water looking at a straight shoreline, and okay, now where do I put my lure? Where are the fish? We gotta do more than that. We gotta study and, and learn what's in that particular area. And so what we do as spoon pluggers, we take a series of lures, you can see over here, we have seven different sizes that go to different depths, and these lures help us strain the water, go from the shallows to the deep. So we take the lures, and we strain the different depths, finding out by, by the path of our boat and by the feel of what the bottom tells us of where the areas are that are different. Now, I'll, I'll pass this around, and you can look at that, but that's a simple line drawing map uh, that helps me. A lot of people say, well, gee, I don't want to sit on draw and draw all the time, and that's, that's true. I used to do that all the time, and I spent too much time at it. What you need to do is get out there, fish it, cast it, troll it to find out about it, and then just mark down a simple line drawing, some depths and things like that. Next time you go back there, you're going to start from there. And you're going to have information that will allow you to go farther. Not next time you come back, you don't draw anything down. Next time you go, well, now where was I? What, where was that bar? You know, how was that? You know, I can take line sights. I can, I can even use a, a GPS or whatever. I'm back to the spot, and then I got in the picture of my mind. I've got a picture of what that does, and I know where the hard rock spot is. I know where the fish are. Uh, I, I know where the brake lines are and things like that. So record what you learn. You learn a lot faster. Not saying everybody has to, but you learn a lot faster by recording what you learn. And don't spend a lot of time. Nowadays, if I'm drawing a map, 30 seconds to a minute and a half, two minutes is all I'll spend doing drawing. 
And then if I if I find out something or catch a fish, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mark it down. Anytime I catch a fish, I don't care whether I have drawn it or know the structure or not. If I catch a fish, I'm gonna go back and find out more about that because I want to know why he was there. Controls and tools. Trolling is our teacher, by the way, and that's why we use the, the lures. Uh, trolling to find the structure and to learn about it. Now, a lot of people, if we had a flatfish and we tried to troll around this structure with a flatfish, we'd take all day. We'd take a spoon plug and we'd run five, six miles an hour. We can learn that, that structure by going down the different sides pretty darn quick. We're done with it. And we, can, we got a chance of catching a fish, too. But we don't, we don't go real slow. And then one of the reasons is that we're more efficient in covering and learning structure. So trolling is our teacher. That tells us about the structure. Controls and tools. Uh, what controls do we have in our lures? How can we, say, let's say we have a spot we want to fish. We take our, our tackle box, a supersized tackle box. We have a thousand lures in it. And they all catch fish because they wouldn't make them if they didn't. A thousand different lures, they all catch fish. They got all kinds of different controls in them. And we want to say, okay, I want to know if the fish want one of my lures down here. Which one do they want? Uh, that's a, that's a real challenge. <laughs> You'd be there all day, all week, all year. Uh, what we have to do is take the controls. What, do we, what can we control in a lure? We can control the depth, we can control the speed, we can control the color, the size, and the action. We can change those. We say, okay, the fish want this color, they want this size, they want this action, they want this depth, they want this speed. But like I said, we take all, the, all those five controls, put them on our tackle box, and try to hit a fish there and find out what they want. And we're there forever. And the fish may not even be there. And so what we have to do is say, let's, let's cut it down. Let's, let's concentrate on the two most important controls that we have. Number one, depth. Depth because not just in feet, 10 feet, but it's 10 feet where the fish are. And we're talking depth. We've got to be where the fish is. So the depth uh, includes being at the depth, but also at where the spot where the fish is. That's number one, because if we can't get the lure in front of the fish, all the others don't work. Color, size, and action, and speed doesn't work. So we've got to have depth, number one. That gets from our mapping and knowing where the structure is on the bottom of the lake. Speed, number two. Why speed? Sometimes we'll catch a fish with a night crawler, and nothing else will catch a fish. Sometimes we'll catch a fish going six miles an hour, and nothing else will catch a fish. And in between. So we have to check all the speeds because the speed will change according to the weather and the water. They're warm, they're, they're moving fast, uh, bam, they'll hit something going fast. They aren't going to notice a night crawler on the bottom of the lake. They're after something going fast, moving. Same way the other way around. If they're real slow, they can't catch up to a crankbait. So we've got to check all those depths and all those speeds that are available to us. Uh, we've got to get the lure in front of the fish. Uh, there's, you know, precision trolling, Lake Michigan, guys with the downriggers and all that. They're thinking depth all the time. And this is good. We, we take it a step further in what we do in that we can control the depth at the same time we can control the speed. Because we can go 9 to 12 feet and we can change the speed without changing the depth. There's very few lures that you can change the speed without changing the depth unless you got it on a downrigger. And even then it changes so much. So these, this, these are tools designed to do that. Uh, getting into tools, rods, reels, markers, boat, motor, anchor, lures, sounder, uh, all of these tools that we use to catch fish, are, we have to look at them as controlling our depth and speed. They, they allow us to control the depth and feet, speed, all the ranges of depths and speeds. Now, uh, I can go into the rods, now we'll do that first. The uh, these are the two rods that basically we use. We don't have, I, I don't have 15 rods in my boat, but sometimes I'll have, you know, more than that, wire and whatever, a couple casting rods. But we like to use a bait casting reel and a stiff casting rod for casting. We both cast and troll. This is about a 17, 20 pound line. Bait casting, because it's the smoothest drag, compared to a, a spinning rod, it's a smoother drag in general. Stiff, because we have control of the fish. Now remember, we're after big fish. If you want, if you aren't after big fish, you really don't need this. But that's that's our goal. After the biggest fish we can catch of all species. So we want to be able to control that fish. 
So we got to have now. Some guys will say, oh, you're a meat hog. No, you want to control the fish. And you want to do it effectively and efficiently. And you don't want the fish to be on the end of the line for half an hour or, or 10, 15 minutes getting lactic acid in the system and you want to try to release them afterwards. And he has, he's half dead. So we want to get the fish in. We want to control them to, to be able to put him where we want him. Take a picture and release them. And we release most of the fish we catch. But we want to, we want to be in control. Uh, I'll pass that around. You can, you can have the guys take a look at that. Uh, it's a little bit more of a challenge to learn a bait casting, but it's not that bad. As Chuck can, can uh, tell us, that uh, he, uh, he uses the bait casting now, don't you, Chuck? Yes, I do. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, crawling equipment. <laughs> Uh, we got a, again, we got a stiff line, actually that's a low stretch line. Uh, this is made by Buck and, it, and it, it gives us the feel. Any, any limp line that would stretch, you wouldn't have the feel of the bottom. And we need to feel the bottom with this because we're trolling fast, we're trolling a lot of uh, territory, and we want to feel what's that bottom down there. Is it mull, uh, marl? Is it uh, rock? Is it gravel? Is it sand? We can tell by just the feel. Uh, short and stiff solid fiberglass give us the oomph because we're reefing on this, we're pulling weeds off, we're doing that because we're covering a lot of territory. Uh, and this, this is uh, the uh, handle turns around going backwards on this particular reel. Uh, I think it's an advantage because you have less chance to get a backlash. This, this is a pretty stiff line so you don't cast with this, believe me. If you ever tried it, uh, some of, there's a lot of guys in here that have tried it, including myself, they can tell you. Don't cast with it. <laughs> so, okay, those are the two tools in the, in the uh, rods and the reels that we use. And uh, a lot of people, when we talk about controls and tools, they say, well, you know, I, I still think that, that fish are, can be pretty selective, you know, and, and what, and that, that's possible. That sometimes they can be selective with what, what lure they hit. I don't have any problem with that. But uh, I also think that in, in many, if not most instances, they are not selective in the color, size, action especially. Uh, if anybody here has kept tropical fish, uh, if you've observed your fish feeding, uh, <laughs> this is just an observation of mine, fish will have feces or droppings that will be going around. If there's current in the water, they'll be swimming around. But you're feeding your fish, they'll grab that too. They'll eat it put it in their mouth and spit it out. And they, they do that. Fish will test things in their mouth. And they don't know what it is. And certainly feces don't look like anything food to most people or fish because the food we're feeding is a lot different than that. They'll grab it. And so whether fish, especially when something's moving through the water, whether fish are going to be that selective is probably a question. And so we have to look at it as let's get something in front of the fish and let's move it at a speed to trigger a reflex. Uh, and see if they hit, whatever it is. And that's why all, all these lures work. Uh, 80 to 90% of depths and speeds that we want to check can be controlled with spoon plugs. Now, that other, that other 20%, we use other lures too. And it could be trolling. Uh, in most cases, it's casting lures. Uh, uh, blade baits, jigs, uh, you know, uh, spinner baits, uh, there's a lot of other stuff we use. When we've got a spot that we want to cast and we want to check it more thoroughly with slower speeds, by all means we use different lures. Uh, but 80, 90 percent of the depths and speeds that we want to check we can do with that lure there. Uh, okay, presentation. How do we present lures? Uh, two ways, casting and trolling. Uh, it's not really what you want to do but it's what you need to do to be most thorough in your fishing. There's a lot of times that I've been out and I've cast my known spots and I can't get a fish. And I get up and I start trolling and bam, I get a fish in the same spot that I cast. And the reverse can be true. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be trolling along, not catching too much, or if anything, and uh, Say, well, I've got to stop this, this spot I caught fish on before. I know it pretty well. Stop and cast and go real slow. I mean, oh, I got a fish. Okay. I couldn't, I didn't go slow enough. Didn't control my depths and speeds properly. So you've got to do both to strain the water and arrive at the fish. Check all depths and all speeds on structure. Now, the next area of knowledge that Buck talks about is lake types. And this is in his book, 
and it, it talks about uh, different lakes having different types of structure. And these are reservoirs, there's different classifications of reservoirs, uh, natural lakes classifications, uh, rivers, sloughs, this type of thing. Now why do we learn this? Why do we learn about all this? Well, to be a, a, a good fisherman in all waters, we need to know what to expect, especially on a new lake. Uh, when we know about lake types, what kind of structure they contain, what kind of water color, what kind of fish species, and things like that as a general rule, when we get on that lake, even if we haven't fished it before, we have something to start with. We know where to begin. And uh, that knowledge is helpful in making us more efficient on the water. Now, I, to I told you before that I was going to talk about uh, targeting the largest fish. And uh, how do we do that, you know? How do you know you're targeting the largest fish? Well, basically, all spoon plugging is designed to target large fish, but I can give you three reasons that I feel uh, that we do catch our share of large fish. Uh, number one, we pick the best structure. How do you do that? Uh, our procedures instruct us to troll around the entire lake. Find out what the whole lake contains, if it's a small enough lake. Look around, use your terrain, that type of thing. And, but basically, uh, we troll around the lake and we learn the structures and we stop and look at better structures a little bit more. Well, what's a better structure? Well, as Buck says uh, in his material, it's the, sh the longest, narrowest, sharpest, deepest break to the deepest water in the area. Uh, that's kind of a mouthful, but, it, but we, you learn as you fish, you learn what is a good structure and what isn't. And those are the ones you're going to spend your time on. Uh, now, why are big fish on the better structures? Well. When you look at the Serengeti Plain, you've got miles and miles of open plain. You've got animals all over the place. 110 in the shade, and you've got one clump of trees down here. That's the ideal spot to be. Who's going to be under the trees? The antelope? No. The big cats. Biggest, meanest, nastiest predators on the plain. They get it. And that's the same way with fish. Okay, second of all, Finding hidden structures. As spoon pluggers, we do find the hidden structures. But what is a hidden structure? From that map that I passed around, there's a lot of structures on there, but that's not all that's on that lake. We find we run across spots that, that we call hidden structures because it's not on there. Nobody else knows about them, or at least most fishermen don't because they can't see it on the map. But when you do your spoon plugging and you troll around, you're going to run across catching a fish, or you're going to you're going to feel the bottom a little bit different, uh, or you're going to find a good sharp break that doesn't even show on the map. Well, those are the areas that many times we get our biggest catches because they aren't fished heavily. And so by being thorough and learning the structure, you're going to be a much better fisherman. You're going to find those spots and you're going to concentrate on them. So we find hidden structures. Now, the third reason I think that we catch our share of big fish is we always, always check faster speeds. If you're a spoon plugger, you're going to check the faster speeds. The reason I say it, you get a little kid running. His little feet are just going like lickety-split and running down the hall. You take a couple long strides and you're running past him. Well, now why is that? He looks like he's really moving. Big fish swim faster. They just got longer legs or longer tail. And so they're, they're the, they got big because they ate more. They got to the food first and they're more aggressive. Well, now what could be better for using faster speeds than that? combination. So we have to use faster, we always have to check it. Now they always aren't going for faster speeds, but we have to check it. And we always check it as a spoon plugger, so we do catch our share of, of bigger fish. Uh, the next is uh, mental, oh, this, this I'll read you out here, and this is something we have to ponder a little bit. Basically, Buck says, all fishing successes and all fishing failures must be answered in terms of depth and speed control. Uh, something we have to think about a little bit. Color size in action can be helpful at times, but first of all, if we don't have depth and speed control and we don't find out what the fish want from that standpoint first, the rest of it isn't, isn't going to be helpful, the color size in action. So this is number one. Uh, I'll pass that around too, but that, that's something we all have to think about a little bit. And a, lot, a lot of times we go back and, and we uh, backtrack a little bit on, on what we do in our fishing. We don't concentrate on depth and speed, but that should be our primary goal whenever we're out on the water to concentrate on the depth and speed. Uh, 
There's, this is his book I mentioned. There's his study guide up there. Uh, the newsletter, there's a newsletter if you want to take a copy of that. Uh, also, there's an email list. If you aren't getting my email, you're welcome to uh, put your name up there. Alan Bobbs does carry spoon plugs. Uh, Buckberry.com is on the internet, and you can get them there. Or Terry Velting and our club will come to many of our meetings, uh, Lumper Hunters and uh, Spoon Pluggers, and he'll, uh, he'll have uh, the rods, reels, the line, the whole bit for you if you want. So uh, if you come to our meetings uh, and Terry shows up, and you, you can get what you want there too. So just remember that spoon plugging is a lifetime of learning. There's enough to learn in this book and that study guide to last you more than many lifetimes, believe me. Uh, knowledge is the key. Okay, are there any questions now? That's basically... Uh, well, here, I, I, didn't, I didn't include the mental part. I'll just go over that. Knowledge and experience. Knowledge in the books, experience on the water with that knowledge gives us the confidence and the persistence to stick with it. That equals success in the fishing. Uh, confidence is important. Being out there knowing that you're doing something that you know works. Uh, that's very important. And the persistence is, okay, I know it works. The fish just aren't moving yet. I'm going to stick with it. And sometimes the biggest catches come from those that are persistent. Don't leave the lake too early. Uh, take, spend their time on the water and do it right. Okay, any questions? You can turn that off.